If you have not reviewed our first video on the proto-ester fragments, which turn out to be first esters, not ester, uh, be sure to watch that video first. But let's begin. Now, while we're on this topic, reopening it from the last video, let's also deal with a few expanded interpretations of the proto-ester fragments real quick which we have covered in 4b of this series to start. Uh, again, make sure you watch that first. See their expansions actually 100% affirm that these fragments are definitively, not even possibly, the Book of Esther. They need to be renamed. They are the proto-first Esdras fragments. That's what they are. I mean, it is absolutely stupid to take that notion further when one sees an exact identification of Ezra by name, his office, his father, his family. I, I mean, you got to be kidding how incredibly illiterate this paradigm of so-called scholarship continues as they really, I mean, I, they, they just make themselves dumber and dumber on things like this. You'll see. Has Esther been found at Qumran, the title says? Uh, I'll answer it real quick. No, not even remotely. Not a fragment of it, not a word of it. Nowhere, no how. Got that? Okay, now we're going to prove it. A scholarly article of stupidity yet again. Link at the bottom, so you can read it all for yourself, but we're going to go through this in pieces. We're not going to do it all because it's long. Uh, for those of us who can read, the answer is no. No way. Not even possible. For stupid scholars, they are still playing along with this idiotic paradigm they set that these are Esther. It was stupid from the beginning, but it's really dumb now. Here's a fragment labeled 4Q550B, okay? Another proto-Esther fragment. Ah, no, this is a lie. It has nothing to do with Esther whatsoever. There's no Esther content here. It's first Estrus. For starters, they add letters and fraud that cannot be added. You just can't do that, and they shouldn't do that. That's It's really poor. Again, for those who can read, that is, uh, we dealt with Peter Ezra in the last video for B, I believe I said, uh, showed you in the beginning. Um, it's either Priest Ezra or Father Ezra, either one. A father is a priest in the Persian pantheon. Uh, that's where the Catholic term comes from. That's where it derives, as most of the religion comes from the per Persian pantheon. Uh, this should be known in scholarship, and how poor to not notice this. I mean, just really poor. We haven't read one article that has even noted that Peter is the word for father and priest. I, I mean, I, 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 it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. None of these are scholars. They're dunces. Again, watch part 4B. We just showed you. But now the king comes to priest Ezra. That is an exact event from first Esdras, by the way. That's not in Esther, who is not a man. Uh, is she? Huh, maybe. Who knows, right? Huh. Might as well be in her story. Uh, and Mordecai does not qualify in any sense, nor does her story qualify as scripture in any sense whatsoever. It's not a Bible story. Uh, priest Ezra fits Ezra the prophet, not Mordecai, which is more than uh, illiterate linguistically. You can't get there <laughs> from Peter Eza to Mordecai, but you can certainly get to priest Ezra really easily. Um, so, in fact, it is exactly that. Um, so now we have a few more letters. Uh, Ezra, clearly identified, uh, is the son of, what's that, J.A.? Uh, no, it's not, folks. There's no J in ancient Hebrew. We know that. It's Y-A. Yah! Hmm, imagine that. He's a son of Yah. That could mean two different things. First, that he's a priest, or perhaps his father's name has Yah within. Hmm, well, we will look at that, and we'll see. See, Mordecai already failed, and first Ezra uh, is basically the perfect match here. But to say that Mordecai's father is there and add an I-R and make a Y a J, I mean, that's just fraud. These aren't scholars. They're frauds. They don't commit anything but propaganda when they do stuff like that, and they need to be fired. 
In 1st Esdras 8, the father of Ezra is Sarah Yah. Hmm, but that's not the actual spelling. Uh, it's close to the pronunciation. He's Sarah Yah. Note to Ezra is uh, identified here as the scribe in this passage. Hmm. Why? Because he's a scribe and that's his family ministry. This will become important as the video goes on, so remember that. This is affirmed in the modern Bible canon in Ezra chapter 7, so nothing new. The word, however, when you break it down in ancient Hebrew is Sarah Yah or Sarah Yahu, as Yahuwah's name is in his, and it actually means Yahuwah is ruler. Again, the Bible practice is all about him, not us. This Sarah Yah is not just any man, but the chief priest at his time, who was killed by the Babylonians when they conquered Judea in a place called Ribla, which we will also uh, see is identified in these expansions. But duh, let's just keep Mordecai and Esther in there, though the temple priesthood is clearly invoked, and neither are. Duh. Uh, how completely inept. So that was B. Let's go to what they are calling 4Q550. That's what all of them are. C. Still a proto-Esther fragment they're classifying it as. Yet it is not Esther in the slightest sense. Now there is even more information that these scholars make themselves really utterly foolish in attempting to stick to forcing Esther when this is very clearly the story from uh, first Esdras and Ezra's family. So obvious. So again, we have Peter, father or priest, Ezra. It's right there in the writing, and that is not Esther. Esther's not a man. I mean, it just doesn't work in any way. And Peter Isa is certainly not Mordecai. That's stupid. That's not scholarship. That's not even a good guess. It's not even something that can be remotely connected. They don't even have the same letters. Now we have more content. Your father is Ezra's father here, okay? Sarah Yah, firmly identified here by the place where he was killed from Hama, or what is known as Hamath. And Ezra rose to service of the king. Uh, that's him firmly. This is clearly all about Ezra. It is first, indisputably, first Esdras. 2 Kings 25, 18 tells us, Sarah Yah, Ezra's father, the chief priest was taken by the Babylonian captain of the guard. Uh, in 21, he and the others are killed at Ribla, which is where? Well, it's in the land of Hamath or Hama. Right from the very fragment, well identifying Ezra and his father firmly. This is not even a debate. There's nothing to discuss. What a joke to consider Esther as having any mention in these fragments whatsoever. Her occult uh, lie is nonsense and doesn't belong in Scripture, and there are no fragments in Qumran that remotely identify her, nor Mordecai, nor anyone from her story other than the king, and that's because that king is the same king under Ezra's return to Jerusalem. Wow. And yes, the Bible affirms Ribla in the land of Hamath many times. Then the fragment further reads, Fear of the house of Safra fell on him. Now some think conquest here, but this is much more akin to the language used to uh, basically invoke an anointing, a calling that fell on this priest Ezra, which is what? Well, it's his office of ministry, which is the same as his father's office, the house of his anointing, his family house of anointing. This is not real difficult, folks. What did Ezra fear? Well, not Babylon, but Yahuwah and his office of ministry. That's what he feared in respect. What is that? Now, 
even the scholar gets this, but then cannot really put it together, which is what we see often, really. It's not that they're completely inept. It's that even when they do see it, they don't see it. It's right there under the nose, but they're not allowed to because it's not in their paradigm. Understand that. There is no house of Safra. That's just not recorded in any significant sense anywhere. It's really not a family name per se, uh, not of note. Uh, this is a position. He says accurately, it may be either a proper name. No, it's not. Uh, he has nothing to show that remotely calls that logical. Now, I mean, when you give two options and you're a scholar, how can you be so inept as to not test the two a little further and then drill down on what should be a conclusion that is very simple? Well, we will do that. We're not going to play around with stupidity. Or, and now, he'll make sense, but he just can't figure it out. A common noun, scribe, which is what Safra means, and that's a fact. We've covered that before, especially in the Garden of Eden, uh, the word scribe, Safra, uh, in the many words, so far, Sophia, different ones. Um, but anyway, that's the word, and he knows it. But see, he knows Esther is not a male as well. But that doesn't seem to bother him. Uh, she's not a scribe. That doesn't seem to bother him, nor is Mordecai. That doesn't seem to bother him that he'll continue down that stupid road and just overlook what is very obvious here. Um, she's no priest. He, Mordecai was no priest. I mean, there's no fitting them into this fragment, but the priest Ezra fits perfectly like a glove, a glove with his first Esdras book. See, but he can't go there. It just doesn't fit his paradigm. He can't do it. He also knows Mordecai is also no scribe, no priest, and cannot fit. But again, he just can't think it through to a conclusion. Because of his false fraudulent paradigm, he gets stuck. And this is what happens in scholarship all the time. It's like they cover things, they go around in a circle only to not conclude anything. So they're not trying to prove, and actually they'll admit they, they don't prove things anymore. They don't try to. Um, and again, in their paradigm, good thing, because they never will. Uh, he will be discredited if he did. However, we could care less. We already know Ezra, a priest, was known as a scribe. But what about his father? I mean, how do we say that's a family ministration? In 2 Samuel 8, 17, Sarah Yah, Ezra's father, was a scribe initially. That is his ministry. That is their family ministry, and Ezra continues such practice and becomes a priest, but he is a scribe, specifically. In fact, in Second Esther's, he actually transcribes books, uh, the books of the Bible that were lost in the fire. So he is a scribe of the utmost importance in the level of uh, almost, you know, Moses and Enoch, for that matter, restoring scripture being used to do so. However, by 2 Kings 25, Sariah is promoted to chief priest. Doesn't change that he was a scribe originally, and that is his family ministration. That's right there on this fragment, right under our nose, right in front of our face. And how can scholars see this? The man is even notable for basically to be included in such a fragment. But let's just make up people instead and claim it's Esther because, well, we like acting like circus clowns because that's what they're doing. Not. No thank you. So that was B and C. Let's go to what they call 4Q550D now. First is a priestly admission of the sin of their fathers. We see that among the prophets in their writings many times. That is priestly language. However, it's something you never see in Esther, nor Mordecai, which never mentions the name of Yahuwah, never gives him credit, never even says he's her uh, God, he's her Elohim, nothing. He's not there. He's not in the narrative. She doesn't thank him. She doesn't care about him. She fasts, but that's a pagan practice in Persia. So no surprise there, and that does not link her in any sense to the biblical practice, which she shows she does not represent. She was a concubine, a harlot, who slept with a king before marriage, used that to gain power, and then used that power to ethnically cleanse her opposition. Rather disgusting. 
It speaks of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin here, though that doesn't really say much. And of course, it is in both accounts. Uh, there's no doubting that because it's the time. Uh, this was at the end of the captivity uh, when Persia had already conquered Babylon and uh, the lost tribes of Israel were returning. In fact, they returned before Esther entered the palace. The question, why didn't she go with them? Hmm. Well, because she was no tribe of Israel. Why wasn't Mordecai back in Jerusalem as well? Well, because he was no tribe of Israel. They don't belong. But then this fragment is very specific to that which is an enemy of Israel, or Judea, Yehudia, which returned to the land. Now that is very obvious here, as the Kuthite man mentioned here, who is, what, holding Israel back at this point, stopping them from building the temple. That's where we are in history. They did stop the temple uh, from the time of Cyrus uh, through the next king, uh, all the way until the time of Darius, when finally the temple resumed, uh, which is uh, in the days of Ezra. And then Ezra returns, and when Ezra returns, the temple's already built. So the, the ones that were impeding were the Samaritans. And wait a minute, who was the enemy of Esther? Well, it was Haman. He's the bad guy in Esther, and he's not a Samaritan. How illiterate to call oneself a scholar and be so stupid as to miss that. That, that is, I mean, inexcusable. You're fired. If you're working for me, you're fired right? <laughs> they disprove themselves with these further assessments, and they can't even see that that's what they've done. That's how dumb they are sometimes, and it's sad, but true. Esther has no connection to the temple, never mentions it because she's not holy and not serving Yahuwah. She's a harlot who slept her way to the top, just as her name, Estar, Esther is Estar, the ancient goddess who was a consort, a concubine, a harlot to the gods. Same. It's her story. This is a fit to a priestly story in this fragment, which originates and matches first Esther's. You can't even go to the book of Esther, Esther as you read this. You can't even do it. It's nonsense. Now, how do we know? First, Haman, the bad guy in Esther, is an Agagite from King Agag. If you read the story of King Saul, the first king, uh, King Agag was an Amalekite. Okay, so that's that's what we're talking about here. That, their territory, is not Samaria in the north, as it must be in order to fit these fragments. And you're going to see that's going to be very specific next. Um, that's what the fragment is talking about, the northern enemy of Israel uh, or Judea, which is the Samaritans. The Amalekites live south of Israel, not north. So how stupid can a scholar be to try to claim that this, this uh, Haman, who is an Amalekite in lineage, so he's from south of Israel, is all of a sudden from north of Israel. This is ridiculous. The enemy's from the north instead. It's not Haman and in the opposite direction. Dumb. These are not Bible scholars and often remain directionally challenged indeed, which we've proven well over. They do not know nor understand biblical geography in the slightest in many cases, especially not in ancient times. Again, these scholars know this stuff, but then fail to put it together. And that's the part that bothers us immensely. And it's because they're not allowed to understand that. They're in their box and they would have to leave their box to draw such conclusions. They go completely in insane directions trying to continue to justify this kind of ignorance. He tells us directly his research shows a Kuthite is a Samaritan. I mean, the, the scholar knows that, not an Amalekite, okay? So a Kuthite is not an Agagite from King Agag. He's not an Amalekite. Therefore, it's not Haman. So Haman does not fit this scroll, period. Now, the conclusion he should draw right then and there is, well, Haman's out. This is not Esther. And then he should start looking for what it really is, and it's first Esdras indisputably. But he can't do that because he's not allowed to in his paradigm. 
Now, he knows this well, but he cannot see the forest for the trees. Let's read. Does Kuthite fit into this scheme? Well, not yours, buddy, but it does into this true narrative, the correct one. The term refers to the Samaritans. Ding, 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 ding. A theme of First Esdras, who mentions and rebukes the Samaritans many times for impeding the building of the second temple. This is not rocket science, yet he can't do any science. Nothing mentioned of this in Esther whatsoever. The Samaritans have nothing to do with Esther. They're not in the story. How can anyone calling themselves a scholar be so blind? Inhabitants of northern Israel. Whoa, wait, the Samaritans, northern Israel, right. Also, they're not mentioned in Esther. So you got the wrong book. How can this guy not see this? But it's all over first Esdras, which is what fits these fragments. Who became enemies of the Jews in their late Persian and early Hellenistic periods. Well, that's right, except you will not learn of them in Esther. They are not there. How is he not seeing that? Well, I'll tell you how, because he's about to commit absolute fraud and propaganda, and you'll see for yourself. There are in First Esther's, to which this fragment belongs, with a rivalry stretching back to the time of Nehemiah. Oh, you mean the other book written by Ezra the prophet and not Esther. Duh. The one that ties to Ezra, 1st Esdras and 2nd Esdras in content and date, period. Oh, this is so easy. Two events stand out in history of the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. Okay, uh, there's a lot more than two, but that's fine. First, the establishment of a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Hmm, now that's an account not mentioned in Esther, because Esther has nothing to do with any of this narrative. Ah, but it's an account we do find in First Esdras. This guy is an idiot not seeing this. I mean, truly, there's no other way to tell it. And second, the destruction of that temple by John Hyrcanus in 128 B.C. There's a lot more about the Samaritans before 128 B.C., but okay. He forgot, though, the story of First Esdras, in which the Samaritans blocked the building of the second temple. That's kind of important to forget if you're a so-called scholar talking of the same era, because that happened at this time during these fragments. The other did not. So, how inept is this? Thus, a Kuthite could very easily be considered... Now, look at what he... Look, 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 look what he does here. Watch. Watch this. You, you'll see this. This is called witchcraft. Thus, a, a Kuthite could very easily be considered an adversary of the Jews. In other words, you can now just paint Kuthite, Kuthite with a completely wide brush and any enemy could be then inserted into these fragments. That's stupid. That is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. And all he's trying to do is justify really poor doctrine from the very beginning because these idiots can't read. Now, do you see what he just did? First, Esdras defines the Samaritans as the enemy of Israel in the time of these fragments, fully fitting first Esdras, and failing Esther completely because she doesn't mention it. And Haman fails this as well. But that's how he tries to stretch it, to try to make it work in such ridiculous... I mean, this isn't scholarship. This is witchcraft, and incredibly pathetically so. He just said, because Samaritans are enemies. Well, then Haman, who is not a Samaritan, can be inserted in place of Samaritans, except it's talking about Samaritans, and next it's going to tell you they're north of Israel. I, I, ah, it's so easy. But see, he, he just can't do it. How illiterate. In other words, you can just throw in anyone who has ever been an enemy of Israel because this is generic, right? How stupid. Then, even dumber, these are not scholars, he then invokes Josephus. Let's remember... He's now quoting a Pharisee. Hello. Now, we quote Josephus too. I think all of us do at some point. But the point is, the way he does this is complete and utter fraud. Watch this. In Josephus, the story of the building of the Samaritan temple follows directly after the Esther story. 
Uh Uh-huh. Is there a point? It means that they're not the same story. It means they're not even the same era, necessarily. Okay, so how stupid can a scholar be? I mean, the book of Esther does not have any such story, right? I mean, he just affirmed that even in Josephus, Esther doesn't have this story. It's separate. It is not the same story. It's not a part of Esther, and it certainly isn't a part of the book of Esther. So it cannot be forced into this fragment that he claims comes from Esther. That's stupid. What a liar. This is very clearly first Esdras, which has the story of that temple even. Yes, the one in Mount Gerizim. It even mentions that they built a temple in the Samaritan lands. What a loser. His justification is horrible, yet he continues showing that. Now, showing that what? Well, he can't think, obviously. (laughs) According to his chronology, Josephus's, the two events fell closely together. Which means what? Nothing! This is an idiot who doesn't even know that Ezra and Esther are the same time. And the building of this temple, as well as the Samaritans impeding the building of the second temple, which you will find all of this in First Esdras. That's where this content comes from. That's where this fragment comes from. It's at least a proto First Esdras fragment, as all of these are indisputably. None of them lead to the book of Esther. It's utter fraud. You don't go to Josephus and stretch his two accounts and then give that claim to Esther in fraud because Josephus covers both. Uh, Regardless of whether he does them consecutively, it doesn't matter. The guy is a liar. This is a lie. He can't even see this is first Esdras, not Esther, and yet he keeps pushing his propaganda in fraud. It's lousy. Again, from his own article. 4Q550, now F. Okay, so we're further in the fragments, but these are all the same content, roughly. Uh, Says, behold, from the north, that's Samaria, north of Israel, comes evil, the enemy. Now, you you don't insert Haman in there all of a sudden, because it's talking about Israel. It's talking about Jerusalem or Judea, Yehudia. Um, He can't even read his own article. That's sad. The building of Zion, the temple, and her shelter uh, of all the poor of the people. Now, they've been conquered captives, so that makes sense. And they call themselves, refer themselves uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the poor many times. You don't need to go to Josephus. The fragments tell the fragment tells you this is the Samaritans, period. You can't then say, well, the Samaritans are enemies. Therefore, we can insert another enemy who is in an opposite direction and not related. Uh, duh, that's ridiculous. It's obvious, and Esther does not go there. This seems to draw a territory line, come up upon it. Uh, they swell up between Media and Persia and Assyria. So it's drawing a, a border there on the east side uh, of the Assyrian Empire, essentially. And the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, more than likely. The Samaritans originated in Media, Persia, Assyria, and Babylon. According to, I think it's 2 Kings 17, the story of the replacements that came in and replaced the northern tribes when they were taken in, into captivity into uh, Assyria. They are the enemy identified here and the same in First Esdras. But not in Esther. No. No, no. The enemy is a guy named Haman and his bloodline who needs to be ethnically cleansed. That's the story. It's disgusting. It's filthy. It's not scripture. So Haman is an Amalekite from the south of Israel, not Samaria. There is no fit, and this is ridiculous, to even attempt such. He can't even read his own writing. So we have well disproven Esther as scripture, for one, but this claim, it was found in Qumran, is one of the biggest frauds of all of it. Why do they have to keep pushing this so stupidly? I mean, this is horrible. It's not even a close connection. It's not even something that they could even assume in a a very distant sense. It's just nonsense. One, they think they can get away with it, and that is fact. Two, if they don't, well, then they're the ancient frauds, and they're exposed, which they are in this series. Two 
late. It is exposed. This is the third video we have produced on such stupid claims of Esther found in Qumran, which is a lie. It is absolute nonsense, never proven, and cannot be proven because these proto-Esther fragments belong to first Esdras. So let's take the positive on this. First Esdras is very firmly found in Qumran thus kept by the biblical keepers of scripture who remained holy according to Ezekiel, the sons of Zadok, who were not Essenes, which is an equally stupid piece of propaganda we have obliterated on this channel. This means first Esther's was scripture 2,000 years ago, and no surprise, it is continued in the Ethiopian canon, and even in the 1611 KJV and 1590 Geneva Bibles. These have always been inspired scripture, and they remain. Esther has always failed. We have about 400 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year now, many just as profound, with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. But join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often and we will notify you ourselves. Just go to thegodculture.com, fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos. Unfortunately, we've had to go that route on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon, and our new podcast is also available for all of our videos as well. All links in the description box. Friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space, original. If you prefer an alternative, now we have Parlor link below. We now have six books published internationally, being read now in over 100 countries, with a new release now available worldwide, the first book of Enoch, the oldest book in history. And now you know, after the second video of that series already underway. I think we've produced three now and more to come very soon. We'll put out probably one to two every week for some time. 52 videos coming, so a 52-week series, we call it, though we're too excited to go 52 weeks. It's going to be quicker. <laughs> Sorry. But it'll be 52 videos. We also have now launched a fear Philippines coffee table book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., overseas markets uh, on Amazon, and it is available in hardcover or softcover there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar with color maps and interior uh, overseas, as many have requested. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines, but that too on Amazon is available in hardcover now, as well as softcover if you wish. All books, including Solomon's Treasure, now are free in ebook. Just go to ophirinstitute.com for all the links for your area for all of our books. More coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.